phenomenon that might be observed in the presence of a monopoly is price discrimination. Price discrimination is in a situation where different people pay the different prices for the same good. There is no justification in cost differences. So it could be charging the different prices for uh, um, adults or students at uh, the movie theater when each of them only take up one seat, uh, charging different prices on an airplane, ch change, charging different place prices for anything that has the same cost. So on an airplane, for it to be price discrimination, you'd have to have two people that are potentially sitting in equivalent seats and paying different prices uh, due to different attributes that they may have or so on. Of course, if you're dealing with first class and economy, well, then uh, the price discrimination is not valid because in that situation, you're not talking about the same service. It makes sense to charge more for more services. It makes sense to charge more because they have larger seats, they take more space, uh, they have better food, more service, more people working for them, and so on. Price discrimination is where you have the same good facing different prices by different people. So what are the conditions required for there to be price discriminations? Well, firms must have some monopoly or market power. So when I say here some, an example of a firm that doesn't necessarily have complete monopoly power could be a theater, a movie theater in Sherbrooke. So example here, movie theater. Okay. They don't have absolute monopoly in the sense that they're the only movie theater you could go to in Sherbrooke. There is uh, La Maison de Cinema, uh, which offers more of the English movie sections uh, in downtown Sherbrooke. Or you have uh, Cineplex, which is closer to Rock Forest. Um, which are the two main movie theaters. So this is a situation that they have some monopoly power, but uh, not necessarily complete monopoly power. No resale of goods is possible between consumers. It's impossible for a student to buy a load of tickets and then go outside and see some adults and sell them the tickets uh, to make a profit and for both the profit, so at a price in between the students and the adults price. It's impossible because once you have that ticket and you go to Traverse, if you have a student ticket, you might have the person at the entrance uh, asking to see your ID. Same thing with bus services. If you take the bus from Sherbrooke to Montreal, and make sure that if you buy a student ticket, you have your student ID ready just about the time that you're going to board the bus. So no resale is possible. Otherwise, price discrimination will not occur. Different consumers have different elasticities of demand, and we're going to see how this works when we look at ordinary price discrimination. Uh, it's just the idea that uh, people are not necessarily the same, because if both groups of people were exactly the same, you wouldn't have an incentive to price discriminate. And we'll see how that works when we look at uh, price discrimination in a second. So there's two big categories, which will be perfect price discrimination. This is rare or completely absent, but it's just good to, to kind of show what's going on. And this is very common, ordinary price discrimination. You might realize uh, sooner uh, afterwards, after seeing this video, that ordinary price discrimination happens quite commonly. If you think of just people who have uh, CAA memberships getting discounts or different things like that. There's a lot of discounts for different types of groups of people in there, out there. So what is perfect price discrimination? Well, here it's a situation that the firm has perfect information about consumers demand, implying that the firm can change its price accordingly to what people are willing to pay. Okay, so we have this situation that they observe uh, how much people are willing to pay, and then they charge accordingly. So I'm just going to do a little graph here to highlight this. So when we draw a demand curve, we said that the demand curve and the willingness to pay are linked. And at the same time here, when we drew demand curves initially in Chapter 3, we often said that the demand curve 
is a combination of um, many individual demand curves makes this market demand. Therefore, if you think of buying a computer or buying something else, well, here at one, dot, one unit, there is one person that's willing to pay this price to getting maybe a computer or getting a, a trip um, somewhere exotic or something else. Yeah. But if you lower the price a little bit, well, then there's a second person that's willing to come. Uh, or it could be the same person paying himself this same product twice. But essentially, you could think about it as being a second person. So there's one, this first person's willing to pay this amount. Second person's willing to pay that amount. So if it's that price, you get both. And then a third person is willing to pay this amount and so on and so forth. So as you drop the price, you're getting the previous customers that you're already getting at a certain price, but you're also getting these new customers as well. So in this case here, imagine that this guy was willing to pay 11,000 or whatever for this product. This one, uh, 10.5 thousand, this one, 10,000. Well, you have a situation that if you have this information on these individuals, you could say, well, the first person is going to pay 11,000. The second person, uh, so let's say this is Jack, is gonna pay 11,000. Jim is gonna pay 10.5. Jerry's gonna pay 10, and so on and so forth. So because you can perfectly discriminate between all individuals and you have absolute information on how much people are willing to pay, you could do this. Yeah. This doesn't really happen. You might see some of it uh, through negotiations and poor countries when you go to the market to buy something, a piece of clothing or anything else. They might try to feel what your maximal willingness to pay is. So when you ask how much is this shirt, they might say, hundred dollars and then you you're like oh not interested and then they'll drop the price till you reach something that you're willing to pay probably uh, below your maximum willingness to pay but still something that you're willing but someone else may walk in 15 minutes later end up paying less than you or end up paying more than you uh, so this is a bit of uh, price discrimination based on how much you're willing to pay so an example of this is uh, market shopping in some countries where uh, the price is not written on the product and you have a, a rough idea of how much it's actually worth. Okay, so if this were to happen and I add this kind of like, uh, let's say this is for one specific firm. So I have a marginal cost curve, which we said resembles a supply curve. Um, this is the market demand that I have. What would be marginal revenue? Well, in this case here, because I'm charging 11 to the first person, 10.5 to the second, 10 to the third, I don't have to drop the price on the previous ones. So in this case here, my demand curve is also my marginal revenue curve. Where would I stop? Well, I would stop here because I would not produce a good that I could only sell this amount and it cost me this amount. So this would be my quantity produce, my quantity over perfect price discrimination. And if you think this intersection point this is the same as we had for the quantity over for perfect competition. So the quantity is good. What's the problem here is if we think about all of this area here, this whole amount here, it's no longer divided midway between consumer surplus and producer surplus. Here we're in a situation where all surplus is producer surplus. Why is that? Well, the producer knows exactly how much people are willing to pay. He charges that amount, so people don't make an excess gain on that purchase. And since their cost is much lower than that specific price, all surplus is producer surplus. Yeah. A little bit extreme scenario, but you can still see it happening in certain instances. And that's the situation where they keep on changing the price based on how they feel you're willing to pay. Ordinary price discrimination, on the other hand, is very common. It's charging different customer groups, different prices based on their elasticity of demand. So I'm just gonna draw something here and then come back to this. So uh, I just want this to be black.
Okay, so <clears throat> if we were to look at going to the movie theater and we were to try to see the difference between uh, a situation where we have adults, so young professionals, people uh, that have a job, no longer in school, earning a certain amount of money, and we have students. Okay. We look at both of these groups and we try to see what their demand curve would look like. If we were to aggregate all adults and all students together, what would their demand curves look like? Yeah. And on, um, so if I think about this, if I think of adults versus students, who would have the maximum, maximal or highest willingness to pay to go see a movie? Yeah. If I think about these two, Maybe a student, or for most students, if you start char charging somewhere like 10, 15, so dollars, then they're gonna stop going to the movies altogether. So the maximum here may be like 15, and there you only get like a few students, very few. Uh, it could be even less, like 15 is a little high actually, for Canada. For other countries, they're used to paying more, but for Canada it is. Whereas adults, on the other hand, we have a situation that maybe the adults, uh, there's still some adults that would be willing to see it at, uh, let's say, a higher price, whatever that price be, it's higher. Uh, this I might change it just to 12. Okay. So we have this situation. And then I asked myself, and the reason why that students are not willing to pay more is they kind of see they have limited income. Even though they want to see a movie, they'll wait for it to be available online. Um, for $12, they could buy a 12-pack or something else, so that's their trade-off. Whereas the adult, if, you, if they really want to see the movie, they'll pay the, the higher price for it. But if the price goes down, okay, if it starts dropping down to, let's say, $5 or something else, the student, there might be a lot of students that end up going to see the movie because at a lower price, at a much lower price, uh, they, they think it's worthwhile, they love the cinematic experience, they have time, and they decide instead of going out, they decide to go to the movies, or they do a mixture of the two, something happens, uh, instead of renting movies, they go to the movies. Whereas some of the adults will be in a situation that um, if the price drops, even if it drops very low, to a very low amount, they might be in a situation that they won't see that many movies because they're very busy, they have kids, they have busy lives, and they have other things to do. So maybe if the price drops, they'll still just see a few movies. So all in all, you could think that the demand for the adults versus the demand, this should be a D, for the students is quite different. Demand for the adults is quite steeper, demand for the students is quite flatter. If you were to, if you, if you can make sense of this, this is not something that was created. It's just, uh, if you can make sense of it, well then afterwards, let's see what would happen if these were two separate monopolies. Well, what we have to add here to determine our choice is our marginal cost curve. And I try to draw it as identical as possible on both graphs because the cost for a cinema seat, whether it's a student or an adult of the same size, doesn't change anything. So based on this marginal cost, marginal cost and demand, well, what's gonna happen to the price? Well, what's missing here to determine the optimal price and quantity is we need to add a marginal revenue curve. So if I add a marginal revenue curve here, it's twice as steep. It should be steep like this. That's my marginal revenue curve for my adults. And here, because it's relatively flat, the other one will be relatively flat as well. I might have made it a little steep. And this will be my marginal revenue for my students. Okay. So I have this situation here. If I look at what price will be charged and what quantity we will be consumed, well, where MR is equal to MC will be my quantity of students. Here, my quantity of adults. What will be the price? Well, the price for the students here may be $8. And here for the adults, I'm going up, go up, up, up. And then I might notice that for the adults, it's $12. Yeah. So this situation that happens, this price discrimination that happens, for a lot of students, when you see 
special prices on student fares. And let's say a few years back, I went to Australia and I was very surprised. I was still a student uh, that uh, there was no student fares at the movie theater there. And I thought, well, uh, these people don't really care about students. In Canada, we're, we're nicer. Uh, the movie theaters and other places, uh, bus services and stuff like that charge a lower price for students. It's just because they, they kind of remember how things were and everything else. Well, actually, um, some of them might be a little nice, but most of them are simply profit maximizing. Okay, This whole procedure here, the goal behind it is to profit max. Because if you were to choose a common price between the two, let's say $10, well, you wouldn't be profit maximizing for the adults. You wouldn't be profit maximizing for the students because at $10, you might get very few students. So you're not making much profit off of them. At $10 here, you might get a couple more adults, which is not really worthwhile. So by price discriminating, you have a situation that you could make more money by charging the appropriate price for all groups. So it's not as extreme as perfect price discrimination where you really choose how much to charge on every individual based on their own willingness to pay, but it's still splitting into groups and the goal behind it is to make more profits. So here we can notice that the adult is much less responsive to a change in price. He would be what we would put as category inelastic. And because of that, he's gonna pay a higher price. Whereas here we're dealing more with an elastic demand. They're much more responsive. So we don't wanna charge a higher price to these people or else we'll lose all of the customers.